Welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. My name is Maria Maddox, and I will be one of your moderators for today. We will be hosting two presenters, Kuti Acharya, who is an assistant professor uh, at the uh, Department of, of Disability and Human Development at Pediatrics at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She is also the director of the Illinois LEND program, and she will tell you a little bit more about herself when she um, gets a chance to start presenting. Our other presenter, we are pleased to welcome Dorelia River Rivera. She is a parent of a child with a disability and currently serves as the director of Blue Cross Blue Shield Healthcare Service Corporation, where she leads healthcare initiatives that assure effective and efficient delivery of quality care in over five states. Pretty busy lady, I believe. So um, just, she will also tell you a little bit more about herself when she gets an opportunity to present here. Um, as usual, you have moderators for today. You have myself, Maria Maddox. We also have Nikki Ostrowski online, and you've heard her speak here, and Alyssa Jones, who's helping uh, with all the technical issues in the background. So um, you might hear from each one of us at some point today. If this is your first time you, uh, to participate in a webinar, in order to get credit for today's participation, you should have an email um, that you received your registration confirmation in. And then at the end of today's webinar, you will get an email as well that will have a survey link in it that you will need to complete in order to get your certificate of attendance. Uh, once you get that uh, survey completed, you should get your certificate in less than 24 hours. With webinars, we don't see each other, um, which is kind of a, a negative in some regards because we do like to look at each, each other while we're talking. But the positive is you're sitting in your desk, at your office, or in your home, and looking out at the sunlight, and uh, which is always a nice thing to do. In order to help you participate a little bit more thoroughly in with our webinars, we have a couple of options and, and ways that you can do that. So first off, um, we will ask you to use your chat box, which you will find under all the list of names. Um, here you can type in any questions that you might have, share any strategies that you might want to um, include, um, have some conversation with each other. Um, our presenters might ask you some general questions and ask you to respond to those in the chat box. And just type in and hit enter and your information will be in there. We also have a couple of other ways that you can respond. So if you go up here and you find your name, under your name there are four boxes. The first box is a little emoticon box, and you can put a happy face, a question mark, whatever you would like to indicate your emotions for that particular moment. The third box is a hand raised box, so our presenters might be asking you a question where they just want a general yes, no answer. So you can use that or raise your hand, um, and you can use that if that is what the presenters are asking you to do. And the fourth box is a polling function box where we will ask, uh, we might ask you questions that have a, a yes, no answer or a choice of three, four, or five answers. And you would click on that box, open it up, and you should have choices that say A, B, C, D, or E. So I'd like for you to take this moment to find that box, click on it, and indicate what your role is in um, early intervention today. So we have a choice of A as a parent caregiver, B is an early interventionist, C is a CFC staff, D is an administrator, and E is other. And if you are an other, we do ask that you indicate in the chat box what that other might be. So everyone find that fourth box and start putting in your answers there. And we'll give folks a few more seconds to respond. Bond. Let's see what we've got. Okay. All right, let's see what our responses are. So for today, it looks like we have a, a good number of EI providers and CFC staff with a mix of other types in between. Looks like we've got a, a technical assistance provider online as well. Welcome, Chelsea. And uh, so ladies, this is who your audience is for today. So with that being said, I am going to turn it over to Crudy and Dorelia and let them do their presentation. Welcome aboard. 
Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kruthi Acharya. Um, uh, by way of introduction, to go along with ma what Maria said, I'm a developmental pediatrician and internist. Um, and so I, my practice uh, currently is about transition care, looking actually more at young adults and adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I first got interested in genetics uh, partly through my fellowship and training because um, ordering genetic testing and counseling families was one of the things that we did probably on our route, one of the things we did probably most routinely in medical diagnostic clinics, which I know that you guys are most familiar with. So um, that's how I came to this topic. Uh, I look forward to talking to you today. Duralia? Oh, hello, this is uh, Durelli Rivera. I actually recognize some of the names on the phone, I mean, on the, on the web box, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to today's presentation. So thank you first to Kutsi for to invite me to co-present with her. I'm supporting Kutsi here, and you'll hear uh, a little bit more about my story a little bit later on in the presentation. But currently, I work at Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Director of Government Programs. I work specifically in Medicaid and government programs, um, and I oversee five states. I got involved in this, in, interested in kind of this genetics field just personally as a parent. I kind of grew up in the early intervention system, and as my daughter grew, got older, started touching different systems throughout um, her lifespan. So you'll hear a little bit more about that later, and my my connection to genetics and why I feel this presentation is so important. Okay. So today. Neither of us have anything to disclose. Um, today, we have a jam-packed session. And so we're going to go over some of the red flags of genetic orders that uh, you might encounter uh, during evaluations with children, review the current genetic screening and testing technologies available, um, provide some information about resources for screening and referral related to genetics, and also cover some strategies that uh, could be useful in communicating with families and supporting families um, as they're going through the process. So we're going to start with a little refresher about genetics. Um, as you know, genes are the instruction manuals for our bodies and for building the proteins that make our bodies function. Genes are made of DNA which carry these instructions. Changes in DNA or mutations often have no effect on the instructions. Some cause new helpful variations, which is something that we don't always think about, and some can also cause disease. While each disease individually may be rare, genetic conditions collectively are common. There are 10,000 known single gene genetic disorders that have been identified and more and more being identified on a daily basis. 30% of pediatric hospitalizations are due to a genetic condition, and 2.5 million Illinois residents are affected by a genetic disorder. So based on these numbers, it's, it's highly likely that you have someone in your practice or someone that you know that actually has a genetic condition, and that's probably actually more than one. Even though genetic conditions are common, it is important to have a high index of suspicion in order to identify them. A powerful tool to evaluate for the risk of a genetic condition is a comprehensive family history. It is actually the first genetic test and a precursor to formal genetic testing. Family history includes what medical conditions family members have and the age of diagnosis, but it should also include information about ancestral background and ethnicity, consanguinity, and adoption status. Family health history should be reviewed at least annually because things change with time. Diagnosis can be revised or made over time based on symptom presentation or the results of new diagnostic tests. In addition to be a clinical tool, the process of obtaining a family history can improve rapport with families. Family history can be helpful to identify patterns of inheritance. By asking about a family history, we want to map out a pedigree. Um, here we have a three-generation pedigree, and this is kind of what we want to um, create for each family. The squares 
our male relatives in circles are females, and the red indicates the person is affected by a condition, and the blue means they are not. Um, and based on which ones are red and which ones are blue, we can actually figure out how this genetic condition is inherited. Screen is actually a useful mnemonic that can frame um, your family history questions and make sure that you're not forgetting any important information. So the SC stands for some concerns. Do you have any concerns about diseases or conditions that run in the family? R is for re reproduction. We know that uh, multiple miscarriages um, can suggest that there's a genetic condition uh, in the family. So have there, been, have there been any problems with pregnancy, infertility, or birth defects in your family? E is early disease, death or disability. Have any members of your family died or become sick at an early age? The second E is for ethnicity. We know that some genetic conditions are more common in certain racial and ethnic groups. For example, sickle cell disease is more common in African American individuals. There are other hemoglobinopathies like thalassemia that are more common in Asian populations and uh, other disorders like PASACs, which is more common among people with of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So ethnicity is an important thing to ask about in this context. And the last uh, end to complete the screen mnemonic is non-genetic. Are there any risk factors or non-medical conditions that run in your family? So in addition to asking what medical conditions um, run, these are some probes that you can use to make sure you're getting a comprehensive family health history. Based on history, any of the following descriptors listed here would indicate suspicion of a genetic condition. Red flags would be the condition er occurring at an earlier, earlier age than expected, the, the condition occurring in the less affected sex, or, the, or in the absence of known risk factors. Also, 2TWO, so a clustering of the condition, is suggestive if multiple family members are affected, or if the condition occurs in more than one generation. Once you conduct a family history, it is, it is important to communicate your findings back to the families. Oftentimes, we may document the family history as negative or unoffensive, but this term is actually uh, doesn't have a lot of meaning for families. So it's important to communicate your specific findings. So if you're concerned about something based on the red flags we discussed, be sure to communicate your specific concerns to the family about the possibility of a genetic condition and tell them about next steps. So you may say something like, because multiple uh, members of your family have cancer, or because multiple member your family, members of your family have learning difficulties, it may be a good idea to talk to your doctor to see if there's something that runs in families. Through developmental surveillance and screening, you may identify developmental red flags. They're listed here, global developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, and hearing loss. In autism, there are a lot of new, mut new mutations associated with, um, with autism, and a third of children with fragile X syndrome, which is a genetic condition, have symptoms of autism. You're very, uh, in the EI um, age group, it's unlikely you're going to see intellectual disability because it's not something that's diagnosed in young children because of the diagnostic requirement for impaired adaptive skills, but you might see these other things. And if found, they may suggest a genetic syndrome, especially if it's in the presence of another, other anomalies. So we're talking about genetics, we're talking about lots of these red flags clustering. There are also physical red flags that you want to look out for. As EI providers, you interact and have seen a lot of young children. And so for this, a lot of it's going with your gut. You likely have an instinct when you see a child and you can kind of tell there's a clustering of dysmorphic features. Um, and that's, that's enough. You don't need to know the exact syndrome or be able to characterize um, specifically or technically the specific features you're worried about. But having that instinct or gut reaction um, is important. So in addition, you're looking for unusual growth patterns. Um, 
that's often seen with genetic conditions. It can e either be decelerated growth um, or low growth um, velocity or increased growth velocity. So you can see low growth velocity in Turner syndrome, um, flattened growth curves and short stature, and things like Marfan as well as Fragile X syndrome, we might actually see overgrowth or increased growth velocity. One of the most important um, organs to look at for genetic syndromes is actually the skin, and the skin it can um, tell us a lot of information when we're talking about genetic conditions. Um, what the picture here shows, um, those, those light um, brown spots would be cafe au lait spots. So six or more are indi indicative of neurofibromatosis, which is a genetic disorder associated with developmental disability. And if you were to see other rashes or easy bruising, bruising and bleeding, that might be also indicative of genetic conditions um, affecting the spleen and a lot of the genetic disorders that uh, present in childhood, like lysosomal storage disorders, would, um, would present like that. So then I'm going to turn it over to Duralia. So hello, everybody. This is Duralia. I'll tell you a little bit about my story and my um, interest in genetics and why, again, why this is important. I'm here today not representing Blue Cross Blue Shield. To be clear, I am here as a parent. Um, and I'm grateful to be here to tell you a little bit about um, your work and why it's important and, um, and why early intervention was important to me. So my daughter actually has a really rare syndrome. There is less than 100 known cases throughout the world. It's called NOMID, Neonatal Onset Multisystem Inflammatory Disease. So it's actually kind of a set of acronyms. And it's a disorder that uh, has persistent inflammation and tissue damage, <clears throat> primarily affecting the nervous system, the skin, the joints. There's a recurrent sessions of mild fever uh, occur with, with, with people with NOMID in general. Um, as you can see in the picture, that is actually not my daughter Kayla. You'll, you'll see her a little bit later. But one of the one of the presenting uh, signs of NOMID is a skin rash that is usually present from birth, and it does persist throughout life. And although it does change um, in size and location, um, but we I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about we have it under control in a little while. The affected indi individuals that have NOMID very regularly have headaches, seizures, vomiting. Uh, because it's really chronic meningitis, so it's an which is an inflammation of the tissue that covers and protects the brain and the spinal cord. Intellectual disability may occur in with some people with this disorder. Hearing and vision problems also may result from the nerve damage. Uh, mostly people with NOMID experience a severe joint inflammation, swelling, uh, cartilage overgrowth, um, uh, and other skeletal kind of abnormalities that could worsen over time. Um, Overall, my my kind of my trajectory when Kayla was young is um, I don't know if I if she would be here if it wasn't for um, the support I got when I was going through early intervention. Um, it was really hard the first year of her life. I knew she had something at about four months, and I was actually at the time uh, working as an interpreter uh, in early intervention. So I actually went to my doctor, um, my pediatrician, and he's still her pediatrician and has been great, but he didn't even know what early intervention was. So, um, and this was about 10 years ago. So, uh, but the support I got through social workers and developmental therapists and the occupational therapists and the physical therapists that I was getting direct, you know, contact with and able just to kind of say, this is happening, this is, you know, I'm not sure what to do about this. And they always, I just remember it, it was such a hard time in my life. And it was, if it wasn't for the early intervention providers that came regularly to see us, I don't know if I w would have gotten through it because throughout that first year, we actually went to 22 different specialists to try to get a diagnosis for my daughter Kayla. And so I think um, I think it's just kind of a, a a good lesson to hear for you that and you know maybe parents don't always know how to appreciate it, but know that they do. I, I know for me, I, I still keep in touch with some of the EI providers that provided support for our family. So that's a little bit of Kayla's story, a little bit of how we got diagnosed. And NOMID is um, a genetic disorder. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a genetic mutation in a specific gene that causes, um, that causes NOMID. And, you know, we can get into the details of the types of genes, but if it wasn't for genetic testing, we still may not know what she has. So yep. that's a little bit about Kayla. 
Hi, Crudy and, and Dorelia. One question came up in the chat box, and it was from Jean. So how far out on the family is considered, you know, like family concern? So as DTs and early interventionists, people often um, interact with individuals who might say something like, my second cousin's child has autism. How far out should um, folks be concerned, or you want to alleviate families' fears and listen to them, but kind of is, is, there, is there a recommendation in that respect? Yeah, so for family history, you want um, the child's, uh, so you want the child's siblings, parents, parents, brothers, and sisters, so the child's aunts and uncles, grandparents, and grandparents, brothers, and sisters. Um, and so that, um, and then the children of, and your first cousins. So that that is what would be a three-generation family history and what we'd be looking at. So things, so family members that are affected beyond that, um, it's less critical to get that information, but if you're seeing a lot of clustering um, in more distant family members it, and enough of it, it could still be something that raises your suspicion. Okay, great. Uh, and then um, someone asked for Kayla, for you specifically, Drillia, how, how did the final physician finally recognize that um, the syndrome that Kayla, Kayla has? Um, it's, you know, I'll make a long story short, but it's really, I went to see a rare disease professor at what was then Children's Memorial Hospital, now Lurie, and he said, at first he thought it was a really rare form of cancer, and we were literally, had already seen so many doctors, we were literally about to start chemo, and they wanted to put a G-tube in her because the only thing people kept telling me, which, oh, she's failing to thrive, she's failing to thrive, which to me equals you're a bad mother and you're not feeding her. And so what, how she got diagnosed is kind of, it's, it's good, a good story to, to parents, the power of parents. So three weeks before we went to see Dr. Listernick at Lurie, he had gotten a package from a mom in Florida that had also gone to see him sometime, you know, in the last couple of years. This mom, in the trajectory of her daughter, who also has NOMID, who lives in Florida, kept every single business card of, of every doctor she saw until her daughter was diagnosed with NOMID. And she sent literally a package of information about NOMID to every single doctor that she saw along the way. And my doctor, Dr. Listernick, who, I was, um, who had, I saw that day, happened to get that package three weeks before that day of, of the appointment. So it was because of that mom who followed up with every doctor once her daughter got the, the solid diagnosis that and the doctor basically said he's like look three weeks ago I got this package but before this I would have told you let's go on with the chemotherapy and see if that works because her white blood cells are so high and um, and if it wasn't wow, for that, that mom, chills, then that it just talks about the importance of kind of ongoing professional development for all of us right you know we learn something and sharing it with others can help inform and move the field because we can't know everything about everything so great story bless that mom as Maria says or somebody wrote. All right, those are great, great responses. I'll let you guys continue. So now we're going to um, switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the technical aspects of genetic screening and testing. Um, the difference between screening and diagnostic tests, but then also kind of um, a more about the different methodologies to test. There, in this, there is an important distinction between screening and diagnostic tests. Screening tests are performed on a specified population and the people being tested do not have symptoms. Diagnostic tests are per performed on specific individuals. These individuals may have symptoms. Screening is not designed to diagnose. It simply identifies individuals at higher risk of developing the condition and after a screening test, they might need a diagnostic test to actually confirm the diagnosis. For individuals who are having diagnostic testing, they might have had a positive screening test previously. And after you have a diagnostic test, you have an official diagnosis, and that might lead to treatment options. So if you had a timeline, usually it's screening tests first and then diagnostic tests. And when we're thinking about family health history, um, and I said it was a genetic test, in some ways it's a screening test. It's a genetic screening test. So here I have a poll for everybody. Um, have you or someone in your immediate family 
had any kind of genetic testing. Um, if you can use the, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and, and find that fourth box under your name using the polling function. Uh, check box, uh, check mark means yes, and X means no. Um, and folks, um, a few seconds here to uh, finish putting in their responses. We're getting some good responses. If you haven't responded, we do ask that you go to that and, and please enter in your, your response so that we can get a tally of all the participants that are here. All right, let's check out the responses. So, ladies, it looks like um, a good two-thirds of the individuals have not had anyone in their family have any kind of genetic testing. So, so I, I think the results, I think that people might have had genetic testing and have not actually known it. So, if you have had or somebody in your family had prenatal care, um, or have had a baby born in the, um, in the U.S., you most likely had some kind of genetic testing. Um, genetic testing is routine for hemoglobinopathies, like sickle cell, as well as genetic conditions at, like cystic fibrosis um, as part of prenatal care, routine prenatal care. Um, in babies who are born in hospitals are tested for genetic conditions through newborn screening, um, which we will talk about shortly, so another type of genetic condition. Um, I, this, um, this demonstrates that so the consent process and the awareness um, and how people talk about genetic testing um, is really variable, and a lot of folks get testing and don't actually even know about it. Um, so now we'll go to the newborn period, um, and this is where newborn screening happens. So newborn screening um, is the heel stick blood draw that babies get within the first 48 hours of life. Um, here uh, in that picture you see the blotting paper that's used to collect the blood sample and that's the paper that's actually entered into the machine that does the analysis. Newborn screening is based on the public health principle developed by Wilson and Youngner in 1968, so a long time ago, that said if a condition is worthy of being tested or included in population based screening, the screening needs to lead to early intervention to, prov to prevent morbidity and mortality. Um, the classic example of a condition that follows those principles is PKU or phenylketonuria. In PKU, affected individuals lack a certain enzyme to break down phenylalanine. It's a protein found in foods. This leads to a toxic level in the body which causes intellectual disability. However, if babies, once they're born through newborn screening, get tested and are identified, they can be put on a special diet that restricts um, the phenylalanine uh, starting from the newborn period, and then intellectual disability can be avoided. Um, positive results, even in newborn screening, do require confirmation. In Illinois, we screen for 29 different conditions. Some are genetic and some are not genetic. In about 2000, or prior to mid, the mid-2000s, each state was able to decide what conditions they wanted to screen for. So there was a lot of disparities, even between neighboring states. So in Illinois and Indiana, we were screening for different panels. So babies were um, picked up or missed depending on where they were born if they had a specific uh, condition. Uh, because of those disparities, there was a lot of um, advocacy work done and now we have a uniform panel across the state that's been adopted by every single state. Um, more recently uh, in Illinois, we've added several different conditions. We've added congenital heart disease as something that's screened for. Uh, several different lysosomal storage diseases, as well as um, SCID, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. So for those of you that have had babies, this example is going to um, seem pretty familiar. Um, so very sleepy parents, they just had a baby, they're rooming in with their newborn, and they're woken up by the lab tech who says, we need to get blood from the baby. 
Later that day, the family is discharged from the hospital, and two weeks later, the parents receive a phone call from their pediatrician. The blood test, remember that blood test the baby had in the hospital? That was abnormal and need to come in tomorrow. This is something that happens a lot, and you can imagine the family in this example is terrified hearing this information. This might be a family that you actually encounter because maybe you're taking care of their other child, um, or maybe they were already referred to early intervention for another reason. So what do you do and what, how can you support the family and what can you say? I think the important thing to remember is that formal consent for newborn screening is not required. It's actually in some states that opt out in, in Illinois, it's assumed consent. So parents might not even be sure like why that blood test was done, what the goals of the blood test were, what they were even checking for. They may, it's also important to remind parents uh, what it was, but also that it's, it's a screening test, that confirmatory testing is required. And conversely, that newborn screening doesn't screen for every known mutation. There's a lot of data to say that parents, even if they've had, um, uh, if they've had an abnormal newborn screen and then they have confirmatory testing that's negative, that means their child does not have the diagnosis that was suspected, um, those parents still, um, for years after, worry that there's something wrong with their baby. So regardless of whether that confirmatory testing is positive or negative, the families that you might see um, who've had this experience might have heightened anxiety about something being wrong with their baby. Another thing, another example of testing done in the newborn period is that of a suspected diagnosis at birth. Here we can have a full-term baby born to first-time parents, the delivery room nurse thinks the baby has features of Down syndrome and alerts the pediatrician. Um, this, this family actually had declined prenatal testing because they didn't think it was going to change what they would do. After examining the baby, the pediatrician agrees that, the, that Down syndrome is the likely diagnosis, looks up, the, looks up at the mom and says, I'm so sorry, and orders a carrier type. So we have another poll here um, based on recent data, what percentage of parents of children with Down syndrome are dissatisfied with the experience of receiving their child's diagnosis? If you could yeah, so go ahead and open function. up that polling function again, that fourth box, and you have a choice of four different options, so we'll give folks an opportunity to indicate what they uh, think are parents' dissatisfaction with diagnosis. The experience of receiving a diagnosis. So I'll give folks a few minutes here. Maybe not minutes, how about a few seconds? So let's see, we've seen quite a few responses. If you haven't responded, please do so uh, now. Okay, let's see what our results are. So it does appear that most folks um, think that about half of the families are dissatisfied with their experience. What's the answer? That would be correct. So a little over 50% of families are dissatisfied with the experience of receiving their child's diagnosis. And this is not data from the 60s or 70s. This is actually recent data from 2009. So despite the recognition that this is something that um, providers and professionals need to work on and that and kind of with the increased importance placed on family-centered care, um, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. So Brian Sotko is actually um, a sibling uh, of a person, individual with Down syndrome, and he started his research um, when he was a medical student, and he's continued it on, uh, and he's at Harvard, and he's a professor, but he's the one who's publishing a lot of this work and using national um, surveys of parents and families um, and individuals with Down syndrome. So he asked them, um, what matters, like how should this information be delivered? And not surprisingly, setting and timing are important. 
so it should be discussed as soon as the diagnosis is suspected, and both parents should be present as well as infant, and it should be in a quiet place, um, and there should be privacy. So none of that is surprising. Um, I think what the most important take home here is how that information is initially communicated to families really does frame and inform their experience, um, and they're looking to providers for guidance. So this applies both in the hospital or whenever you first interact with that family, especially if the family of a young children or a family um, whose child was newly diagnosed because they're still adapting to the information, they're still gathering information, they don't have a lot of lived experience, um, so they're looking to you to see, um, to look at for your signs to know how they should be reacting. So language really does matter. Be positive and calm. Um, they just had a baby, so congratulate them on the birth of their baby. Avoiding language, expressing pity or, pity or sorrow. And many families um, don't have a lot of experience with Down syndrome or with possibly another genetic condition. Um, so it's important to ask uh, where the family's at. What have you heard about Down syndrome? What do you know about Down syndrome? This allows you to kind of gauge where they're at. Um, what they're most concerned in, and it allows you to, if they do have any misinformation, to address that in a straightforward way, as well as addressing their fears. There is a tendency to provide a lot of information when there's a suspected diagnosis, um, but families are overwhelmed in general, and remember we're thinking in this case about a family of a newborn, right? So they have a lot of things going on in general, so we don't want to overwhelm them with information. Once the diagnose, diagnosis has been confirmed, there's been some other, inform, there's been some, again, some additional research to saying what do parents actually want to hear once, once they, the diagnosis is confirmed. Parents and professionals actually prioritize different information, and for this particular study, professionals here were genetic counselors. So parents wanted to hear about abilities and potential. They wanted to hear about the long-term perspective and prognosis, employment opportunities, community participation, opportunities in academic achievement, Special Olympics, the positive impact this might have on siblings. Um, and many of the genetic professionals were more concerned about things in the more in the short term um, because this was a newborn period. So they were thinking more about medical comorbidities and, um, and co-occurring conditions. And so I think it's important to realize that parents might be valuing something different and it's important to address um, their concerns as well. Moving out of the newborn period, we have genetic testing in childhood. There are two types of childhood genetic testing or two different contexts when it can occur. The first is targeted testing when a child has red flags or symptoms according to published guidelines. So if a child is diagnosed with autism or developmental de global developmental delay, and this could be something that happens in medical diagnostic clinic very frequently, that's where the recommendation is made um, in, in young childhood, that child um, most likely will be recommended to have genetic testing. The other context where genetic testing happens in childhood is, is cascade testing, or listed here, pedigree analysis. So based on our family history and our pedigree, um, if there seems to be a pattern, um, then, a, then somebody might be tested. Or um, if um, somebody might be tested, or if you're a family member of somebody who has been tested with something, then you could be tested as well. So those are the two instances uh, of childhood genetic testing, and I think that the green arrow is something that's going to be much more commonly done, um, and that's probably what your experience has been in the EI system. There are a lot of different reasons for genetic testing. Um, oftentimes, we think kind of the most common one is to under clarification of etiology, to figure out if there's a genetic explanation of what is going on. Um, but there are many other reasons. Um, that genetic testing might be undertaken. Um, it can provide the family information about the expected clinical course and prognosis um, and, and lead for pl family planning. So if a family knows, if there's a child with a motor, uh, motor delay and there is a concern about 
um, or maybe a neurodegenerative genetic condition, then maybe that would be helpful for the family to know so that they could plan living on a, in a single um, in a single story home versus moving. Um, recurrence risks. So if a family is thinking about having other children, this information might be helpful to inform those decisions. Um, once you have a genetic uh, diagnosis, depending on what it is, it might help refine treatment options and open um, options up or, or open options up to research protocols. If you have a genetic diagnosis, you don't have to pursue the, the diagnostic odyssey, um, which is going from doctor to doctor looking for what's wrong, because then you would know definitively what the answer is, so you could avoid um, unnecessary or redundant, redundant tests. And probably one of the most important things is the condition-specific family support. Um, so families are able to get peer-to-peer -peer support from other family members going through the same thing. Um, when, when families do go to geneticists, oftentimes, or go in for genetic testing, um, oftentimes they're not sure why they're actually there and what the reasons are for getting genetic testing and what they might gain from it. Um, as a developmental pediatrician, um, we were often sent folks um, to us who had a diagnosis that um, the pediatrician wanted us to kind of talk about genetic testing um, or talk about etiology and part of that was um, the potential for genetic testing. And the parents, you say, well, why are you here? And they say, oh, because my pediatrician sent me and they wouldn't actually know why. And that's the same thing is repeated in um, geneticist offices. So I think it's helpful to prepare families to what uh, the possible or potential utility of genetic testing is. So that, so that they can under, they can think about it and reflect on it and think about their values and where they are in their life to see how it might be helpful to them and decide if they want to use it, pursue it or not want or do not want to pursue it. And it's conceivable, like thinking about this, that some families might not want um, to get genetic testing um, or you know consider genetic testing, and other families, some of these things might be specifically important, and so it might help them. Um, motivate them to uh, pursue it. So these are kind of the comprehensive reasons for genetic testing, and of course there might be some more individual reasons as well. So they, these are four types of cytogenetic tests that can be used in children. Which genetic test is not routinely used? I will be going through each of these to tell you what they are. But if you could just indicate with the polling feature. Okay. Um, make sure you're looking at your polling function there. All right. Fourth box. Folks, uh, about uh, 10, 15 seconds here to respond. This one's a little tougher. Okay, I'm not seeing any more responses coming in, so let's see what your responses are. So, um, as you can see there, it looks like um, the options were, most, most people chose B or D as tests that were not routinely used. Correct answer actually would be whole exome sequencing. It is still something that is reserved for research purposes, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what it is and why, um, and why that is. So karyotype, um, fluorescence in situ hybridization, also known as FISH, and chromosomal microarray are all used pretty routinely in clinical practice. So karyotype um, is probably one of our most basic um, genetic tests. It, it's a test to identify and evaluate the size, shape, and number of chromosomes in a sample. You can see this is what a karyotype actually looks like. It's pretty, it's a gross picture. Um, it's a fairly crude picture at low resolution. But you can see the different pairs of chromosomes. Um, and you can see the XY, the sex chromosomes um, at the end. Um, if this were a child with Down syndrome, you'd see one more chromosome um, 21. So there'd be three there. That's why it's called trisomy 21. Um, from this picture, not only can you tell if there's an extra chromosome or if a chromosome is missing, um, you could also tell if uh, part of a chromosome is misplaced. So if part of chromosome 10, they didn't have that X, didn't have one of those arms, and it was 
added to a different chromosome, and so there'd be some um, asymmetry in the length of the um, the chromosome arm. Um, we call that a translocation. So that's something else that you can tell in a carrier type. And translocations are a type of mutation um, or a type of genetic difference that can cause that can cause genetic disease. Um, based on carrier types alone, uh, approximately 4% of patients with developmental delay, autism, or multiple congenital anomalies would be detected um, or would be identified as having a genetic um, condition based on carrier type alone. So we call that the yield for a carrier type would be 4% in that population. So that's great. It's been around for a long time, and it gives you a lot um, it gives you a lot, um, it does give you some information, but doesn't give you um, high resolution information. So then uh, to the right, we have fish. Um, in fish, we get a better, more detailed picture, but um, the drawback is you need to know exactly what you're looking for and where to look for it. So you need a high index of suspicion for what the exact mutation is based on your clinical findings, so like the symptoms a child has. For example, if you have a, um, a patient with clinical symptoms of DeGeorge, um, you would get a fish test looking for that region of the chromosome 22, and that's what's shown here. So you should have two copies of that. So the normal chromosome has two copies. One is pink and one is green. But when there's a deletion, you don't see that pink stripe. So this would be a positive fish for a DeGeorge mutation. What we're learning about, though, is that there are you can have symptoms of these classic syndromes, like DeGeorge, but they're not caused by, uh, they're caused by a mutation in another part of the chromosome. So if I were, to, if this person were to have one of those mutations in a different part of the chromosome and I was looking for DeGeorge just in this chromosome 22, I might miss it. So it would be nice to have something at this level of resolution, but looking over the entire chromosome. And that's where chromosomal microarray comes in. It's kind of a combination of fish and carrier types because we're looking at everything, but we're looking at it in much higher detail. So um, in a chromosomal microarray, it tells you what genetic information is missing, but it doesn't tell you information about where it's missing from. So you, know, might, not, you might, might know it's not there, but you don't know exactly where it is, um, if it was moved in, if it was moved like that rearrangement we talked about. Um, and people with developmental disabilities or major anomalies that we spoke of, the microarray has a yield of 8%. And the microarray now is the test that's recommended um, in children who have autism or global developmental delays. So this is actually the go-to test that, that's being recommended. Our science and databases about microarrays is still young. So if you were to get a microarray, there's three possible outcomes. The first um, is, let's say we have an example of Johnny, who's having some developmental diffi uh, difficulties. Um, and he has a microarray done. Um, and if the results that we get, we look in our database and we say, oh, you know what, we look in the database and um, the difference that he has, if we look it up, um, there are many kids who have that same difference and that's also associated with the same kinds of developmental um, delays that Johnny has, then we'd say this is an abnormal result. And we, know, we actually know the etiology of Johnny's um, difficulties. The next thing that could happen is that we look, Johnny has difficulties, we, we find the results out, and we go back in the database and we look, but the, the mutation, that, the differences that we find um, are listed, are listed in, um, are listed, but they're not listed, so it's a, known, it's a known difference, but we know it to not cause difficulties, and we'd say this mutation is likely benign, so we actually don't know what's causing Johnny's difficulties, but it's not likely this genetic difference. And then the last group that's a little bit um, tricky is if Johnny has results, the results Johnny uh, gets, if we look back in our database and we don't have any information about it, we actually don't know what it means. And that would be called a variant of uncertain significance. So it actually could be causing Johnny's difficulties, or it might not be, but we have actually no way of knowing. The next step in this situation, what we do is that we would um, 
actually test the parents because the parents are typically developing and they have the same mutation, then we think it's more likely to be benign. But if the parents um, don't have it, then we think, okay, maybe it's actually causing it, but there's no way to tell. So since our science is still young, there's going to be a large group of um, families and children who go through microarray testing and they're going to have still really uncertain results. Um, I think that's one of the interesting things about genetic and genetic testing is that we think it's so definitive, but in reality, there's still so much uncertainty. So here are the three um, tests that we've talked about and what they can and can't do. The last thing is DNA sequencing, or we're talking about exome sequencing, and that was part of the first question that we had. It consists of selecting a subset of the DNA that encodes proteins, known as exons, and then sequencing it. That's about 3% of the genome. Um, there's so much uncertainty in microarray. There's even more uncertainty in this type of testing. It's only done in specialized genetics clinics. Um, the informed consent process takes up to two days with dedicated geneticists to actually have people undergo this because there's a lot of stuff we don't know. The uncertainty is really high. Um, and then there's concern when we do get something, we don't really know what it means. Australia? Okay, sorry, I was on mute uh, for one second. So I'll tell you a little bit about how this kind of um, uh, leads into my continued story with Kayla. So Kayla, actually, this is actually Kayla, and this is right before she started getting her treatment. I don't know how many of you um, on the webinar have heard of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, but um, the, the, that is where she actually got the genetic testing and got diagnosed. So um, when we were there at the doctor's office at Lurie, you know, he basically said, you know, I think she might have this rare disease called NOMID. And at the time he said, and if, if she does have NOMID, I think she's maybe one of 15 in the world, and and in, in let's say does she does have nomad, I had I would have no idea how to treat it. So that um, that was like kind of an entryway into okay now now what do we do? So um, you'll hear a little bit more about the NIH um, up ahead, but basically we traveled to the NIH National Institute of Health within two weeks of that doctor's appointment with Dr. Listernick at Lurie, and that is actually where she got diagnosed. I think the second day we were there, um, uh, Kayla, uh, Kayla was, you know, she was in a lot of pain at that time. You know, she had in, in and out bouts of meningitis, so we had to really um, focus on what, what she needed to get in order to get treated, and we wanted to know, and like I said, I think this type of testing, you know, it's, it's very personal. You know, I think it's, it's not always um, it's not the answer for all, and I think it's a very personal choice to do it. Us as a family, we decided we want to try to see if we can figure out what it is because we saw her in, in a lot of pain, and she had a lot of fever. She wasn't growing, and so we decided to go through with the genetic testing. So they did test her, and they did find that she had the NOMID gene, and at the NIH, they did kind of an array of testing. So um, as Kuti was talking about the, se the, the, the sequencing, that's what Kayla got done because the NIH is a research hospital and they wanted to, you know, quote unquote, use her blood in order to figure out what, her, what other pathways she had that could be similar um, to NOMID and with, with the long run being that that could lead to a pathway to cure other types of diseases. So for me, genetic testing is, is important for, for many reasons. I think um, you'll hear um, you know, throughout the presentation about why, but um, I think it's key to hear that if it wasn't for her getting diagnosed, we don't think we would have had the treatment that she has now. So it's, it is, most cases are genetic with NOMID. There are some, though, kids that have NOMID that have, they have not found the gene that's associated with, but they have all of the symptoms. So once again, it shows that you can go through and decide you want to go through genetic testing and at the end uh, not really have a definitive answer. And then that's when you take a second course and you say, okay, now I want to just treat the symptoms and see if at some point, you know, they find, quote, unquote, the gene that's causing 
um, NOMID or any other types of a range of diseases um, similar to NOMID. So that's how she got diagnosed with NOMID. And you'll see on the picture um, the rash that she has on, 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 her, on her face. Um, that was kind of a daily occurrence. And, and, and it was hard to see her like that many times just because, you know, people are afraid, you know, they see her and does she have, you know, is it measles, is it mumps, what is it? You know, and so, um, so we're grateful that our experience was a positive one in getting through the genetic testing at the NIH. Okay, it's Mickey back. Um, let me say, um, Darylia, what beautiful eyes she has, too. Those piercing eyes that Kayla has looking at you are, um, I'm sure she could get any cookie she wanted or brownie if she asked with those eyes. <laughs> a, cu a couple questions have come up. Um, one question from Kathleen was, um, can we and do parents receive information about newborn screening during prenatal visits? So has that been your experience, what you've seen or heard, or during prenatal visits are we rarely taught um, told anything about newborn screening? So um, it's one of the recommendations to actually, um, it is one of the recommendations that discussion of newborn screening should happen in prenatal visits in the OB office. Um, it's kind of a turf war, so OBs don't know. Um, they're doing other stuff, so they think it should kind of go back to the pediatrician. And so it's actually not routinely done in either. So um, even if folks have a visit with a pediatrician, it's not done in that situation. Um, on the flip side, it's not done in the OB office. Um, so there's still gaps about the informed consent. Oftentimes, it's the resident that goes in um, while the parents are half asleep and kind of reviews stuff. So it's not a, it's not done very well. OK. Um, another question by, from Maria was, who delivers the news after genetic testing? Who's typically the one? Is it a, is it a pediatrician? Is it a nurse? Is it the geneticist, a social worker? Kind of what's the usual um, context or situation for that? So it, it, a lot of it depends on the setting. So for example, if, um, if in the case of a, a baby with suspected Down syndrome, um, geneticist, the, the, the hospital geneticist might be um, included in that conversation and maybe one ordering the test and then would be the person that family would be following up with. Um, if it were newborn screening, um, that's done in the hospital, but then it's left to the pediatrician. So the pediatrician would be the one um, talking to the families about it. Um, so it, it kind of depends where the, when and where um, the concern is raised about who they would talk to. Um, but usually the person ordering the test um, is the one who should be talking to the family, except in the case of newborn screening when it's ordered, it's ordered kind of, um, because of public health screening um, in the hospital and the pediatrician is the one to follow up. Okay. Um, another question was, other than newborn screening, what percent of the birth to three population has any kind of genetic testing? Are we talking about like 1% or are we talking 25%? Some of these more advanced kind of um, yeah. testing. So, um, great question. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, every child who has autism or developmental delay, so a large number of kids, or global developmental um, delay, so a large proportion of kids in EI should um, should have genetic testing considered, right? So that means somebody needs to think about it and say, should we do it, and kind of go through those reasons to see if it's useful for the family. Um, I think that the uptake of genetic testing um, is different than the recommendation for genetic testing, a lar in large part because of insurance coverage and payment. It's expensive and is not always covered. So there are families that might have the recommendation, but because of the hoops to actually get the testing, they don't get it done. So I actually don't have numbers. I know those are some of the barriers to testing. Um, and in the EI population, um, the kids who have a diagnosis of autism and who have a diagnosis of a global developmental delay, um, they should be getting testing. Okay. Interesting comment, though, about kind of the, you know, how insurance then drives um, even the ability to access that, I guess. Completely. Yeah, and then there's um, another question I just saw. Uh, uh, hold on, sorry. Um, 
about, oh, is it from Jean, is it relevant to note to the OBGYN when something, quote, runs in the family for verbal slash limb apraxia? Is there a genetic test? And then what about fetal alcohol syndrome in cousins needing to be shared? So kind of two different questions there. Yeah, so um, the first is, was about verbal apraxia, is that right? So if, um, I don't think, t I think the, the provider that you'd want to tell that information to would not be the OBGYN per se, but it would be actually the pediatrician who's following the child who's going to be born. Um, and so, yeah, I think giving them a heads up about the family history can be helpful so they know what to look for and they might have heightened surveillance. Um, for the question of, the second question was about, remind me, please, Nikki, the second part of that question. Sorry, I turned my mic off. Um, <laughs> the other one was, is there, um, for fetal alcohol syndrome in cousins, is that kind of information need to be shared? So, um, I think you're getting, I think there's an upcoming webinar on fetal alcohol syndrome, yep, but, um, so some of that is related to exposure, and so, you know, you can have shared exposures within families, um, and so, again, I think that information, sharing that family history information is always good, because, again, um, it, it, for fetal alcohol, it might not trigger genetic testing, per se, because there's no test, there's no genetic test for fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, but it could lead to an increased um, more support for that family or other things if they have a shared exposure um, to alcohol. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I don't want to push you. I know you have some time. You know, that you still have some more slides you guys want to go through. There's other questions on the chat room. You want me to ask some more now, um, Critty, or you want to wait a little? Can we little? wait till the end? Absolutely. So I'll just kind of keep track of what's on here because there's lots about resources and um, genetic testing as well as, you know, what we as EI providers should do. So absolutely, I'll yeah. let you. And I, I think I'll cover some of that as we get um, towards the end with resources, and there is a resource handout as well. Perfect. Okay. okay, I'll let you get back to it then. Thank you. So now here, this is about communicating with families around childhood testing. Um, there are a lot of different barriers to effective communication. Genetics is hard. Um, it's hard to understand when we're talking about odds and um, increased odds and ratios. Uh, providers um, actually might not know everything about it or the testing that they're actually recommending. So we might have imp um, imperfect or partial informed consent. There's limited access to genetic counseling. I will later show a map of Illinois. Um, where it shows where the, um, the public health centers are and where we can get genetic um, counseling services. There are many counties on that map that don't have um, services um, at reduced cost, so access is something. There's cultural considerations. Um, among the African-American community, there's data show there's more mistrust, especially around genetics. There's an expectation gap. and what that means is that when you go into genetic testing, you think you're going to finally get an answer and you're going to have all, you're going to have the knowledge. But as we talked about, there's still so much uncertainty. So you can be left actually not knowing. So you might think that you've wasted time and money and you could be disappointed, especially if you went through a lot of hoops to get the testing. Um, so parents might not be in a place to actually hear what you're saying about it if this has happened. Um, and lastly is genetic determinism. Again, genetics feels so definitive, but in actuality, there's a lot of other things that can affect outcomes. Um, genetics has variable expression and incomplete penetrance. That's just kind of technical terms that just because you have a gene doesn't mean it's going to show up in your clinical presentation. Um, you also you also have other factors like experience and exposure and the family that um, can also affect outcomes. So these are all things to kind of talk about and this, what, this, this is what makes talking about genetics so complicated. So um, the question was asked, who's having these discussions? It should be the person ordering the test and the person ordering the test should actually do pre-test counseling and that's also known as informed consent. Informed consent means talking about the benefits, risks, and alternatives to testing, and the alternative to genetic testing is to not have testing, and that's something that needs to ex be explicitly said. 
Um, though we did uh, we did discuss that pediatricians might not feel very comfortable having these conversations. Um, and so you might have families that talk to their pediatrician but are still a little bit confused about kind of what's going on or, you know, even what genetics is and things like that. So um, if you were ever asked, uh, if you had a family who's struggling with this and asking, like, should I do it or not do it, I mean, I think a good place to start is with an, ex with an ex explanation of what testing um, can do. So this is what chromosomes are. People have two copies of each chromosome and we inherit one from each parent. Sometimes people have missing or extra chromosome material that impacts development, and testing can help us figure out um, w figure out more about this information. Um, and using pictures can definitely be helpful. So the benefits of testing, it can reveal the cause. Um, so we might figure out what's the cause of Johnny's difficulties, but as we discussed, we might also um, not figure out the cause or uh, not know if we've figured out the cause. So those are important caveats to actually include in this discussion. It may inform prognosis, but there's not always a one-on-one -on -one correlation between genotype, meaning our genetic code, and our clinical presentation, meaning our phenotype. Um, as I discussed, environment and experience matters. There's a lot of um, interest in something called epigenetics, which is different other protein coding areas in the genome. So there's a lot of variability. So yes, it can tell you about prognosis, but it's not definitive. Um, I have a, a colleague of mine had a, a, a family who um, the child was now about eight and was in early, uh, was in special education and was doing well. Um, and then finally they did the microarray and they found out that he had a very specific genetic disorder. And when you were to look up this disorder, it said that he wouldn't do, it, um, the prognosis that was written about said that he, um, that he couldn't, that he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he couldn't learn. It was one of those really depressing, maybe even outdated descriptions. And the family said if we had known that before we had started our journey, it would really have changed our decisions and what we would have done and what we would have expected from our child. So I think that there's always individual variation. There's a range of clinical presentations. There's a range of natural history. And so that's an important thing to stress to families is that we don't know a lot about genetics. And even of what we do know, we don't know everything. And it's not, it doesn't mean, it's not a be all and end all. There are some risks to genetic testing. Um, I tell families that it, it's, I'm testing for a genetic test, so I, I'm testing Johnny, but it could also tell me information about you. So it could be that you are a carrier. Um, there's some stigma associated at times, um, depending on the family and cultural and other considerations about being the carrier, the one who passed the gene on to the child. Um, misattributed paternity, this happens more than you would think, that we realize that dad is not dad based on genetic testing, so that's another important thing um, to let parents know about ahead of time. Um, and there's also the risk of discrimination. So here, this was a New York Times article in 2014, and this was actually about a physician who had a family history. His mom had a fatal neurological disorder, um, and he didn't want to get tested because he didn't want to face discrimination, but he wanted to have a baby. And he and his wife actually decided to do IVF and to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, it means they test the embryos for the mutation, but he doesn't get tested. Um, and so they can select out um, embryos that have the fatal mutation. Um, and then he wouldn't risk um, facing discrimination. So it's something that um, people are still worried about and people are still anxious about and people are still making decisions based on that. So it's something that families should know about. GINA, which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, was passed in 2008. I have a true-false question here. Um, does GINA protect against all types of insurance discrimination? True or false? And this is based on genetic, um, based on a genetic diagnosis. Give folks a few seconds here to put in whether. response. So 
So I see the responses. <laughs> I see the responses. Um, and about half of the folks said false, and that is correct. Um, Gina protects against health insurance discrimination, meaning that genetic information can't be used to make eligibility, coverage, underwriting, or premium setting decisions. Um, Gina also protects against employment discrimination, so decisions based on hiring and firing or job assignments cannot be um, based on genetic um, information. Uh, it's an important thing to say that these, uh, even though it protects against these two things, it's hard to prove um, if there is discrimination based on genetic information. Gina does not protect against other types of insurance discrimination, so life, disability, or long-term care insurance. Um, is not protected against, under GINA. The Affordable Care Act actually also fills in some of the loopholes related to health care discrimination um, for people with genetic conditions. It, because of the pre-existing condition clause, people with genetic conditions cannot be denied coverage. Um, and the ACA has also set out specific parameters um, that spe specific variables that premiums can change based on, so age geogra um, or geographic area, but it can't be medical conditions. So people with genetic conditions cannot be charged higher premiums based on their genetic conditions. So after pre-test counseling, so the risk benefits and alternatives, and you have your testing, and then you have post-test counseling. And here at post-test counseling, again, I think reviewing the limits of what the test can and can't tell us is really important. So abnormal or likely benign means we know or we don't know the likely cause of your child's difficulties. In the case of uncertain significance, I think it's important to speak plainly. Um, we found some differences that may or may not be responsible for your child's difficulties, and we have to do some more testing. Um, uh, kind of touching on what the role of the EI provider is in this, I think supporting the families through all of this and um, being a sounding board as families are trying to understand and grapple with it um, and connecting them with resources um, if they're having a hard time trying to figure out, you know, what did that testing mean or should I get testing, kind of connecting them to resources. So we will talk about it, but there's a lot of different follow-up that should happen after post-test counseling. So resources in, in general to support groups, um, a referral genetic specialist that could be a counselor or a geneticist, and then follow-up that could be within the medical home, um, and that could also be with the EI provider just checking in to see how things are going. Yes. So, can you hear me? So this is uh, Dorelli again. Just to tell you a little bit about, I'm just kind of wrapping up Kayla's story, and uh, you know, post NIH and you know, ongoing with the NIH. So this is my daughter now, Kayla, and uh, you'll see her there with her medal. She's um, often running 5Ks with me. I've run um, a few 5Ks with her, and you know, other we're working up to a, a half marathon together. So she's doing really well. She's in sixth grade. She's a um, really smart kid. And of course, I'm a little biased. Um, she's in the diplomat club. She's in volleyball. She does yoga. Um, she keeps me very busy after hours, at work, after work hours with her activities. Um, so that's Kayla on the left. So I think it's kind of a testament to kind of our journey and our story of where we, where we were and, and what it took to get us to where we are now, including um, genetic testing. Um, the picture you'll see on the right is a lot of the work that I do outside of Blue Cross Blue Shield is the advocacy work that I continue to do for people with special health care needs um, of many types, including, obviously, rare conditions like Kayla's. So the picture on the right is actually the director of the National Institutes of Health. Um, that's Director Collins. And I'll tell you just for a minute, if you've not heard of uh, the National Institutes of Health before this call, it's made up of 20 different um, components called institutes and centers. And each, each of them has their own specific research agenda. They often focus on particular diseases or body systems. So for example, um, the ones that would be of most interest, and I say this to you as EI providers as a resource because 
and again, this is my perspective as a parent, there is no other um, website that I refer to that's as comprehensive as the, as the NIH. Um, the NIH is made up of, like I said, 27 different institutes. Within those institutes, they have, for example, the National Human Genome Research Institute, National Institutes on Child Health and Human Development, the National Cancer Institute, National Eye Institute. Um, you know, they go everything from the, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, and it's a research-based center, and most of the work that other hospitals do throughout the fund, throughout the country get some sort of funding from the NIH to do research locally. For example, in Chicago, Northwestern has funding to do research. RIC has funding from the NIH to do research. Rush has uh, funding to do research. And right now, there's a lot of focus on, and this is why this picture is important, um, on what um, President Obama initiated last year, the uh, precision medicine initiative or personalized medicine. Kurti can probably speak to it a lot better than I could um, because she's involved in it in, in that way. But this, this picture was the director on the left telling the president about Kayla and her story of why research is so important um, for all diseases throughout the world. The NIH sees people throughout the world. So th this is a picture of him speaking with um, President Obama of, of why it's important uh, to do research, it's important to do genetic research, and this is right after the kickoff of uh, the President's PMI initiative, Precision Medicine Initiative, and so he announced last year in, in January, and I was invited as a parent to go to the White House for, for the unveiling of the details. It's really like a bold new research effort to really just revolutionize how we improve health and treat diseases of all kinds. Um, it was a launch with an investment of the President's budget, and it really just pioneers a new model of it's patient-powered research that accelerates like biomedical discoveries and pro provides clinicians, you know, providers such as yourself, with tools, knowledge, different therapies um, to select which treatment will work for which patient. So, you know, a lot of what we've done in the past as medical treatments have been designed for quote unquote the average patient, kind of a one size fits all. And it could be successful some, for some, but not for others. And PMI, if you look it up, it's, it's, there's a lot of information out there about this, is just the emergence of medicine, an innovative approach to disease prevention, gene therapy, if that's what people choose or not. Like I said, it's a very personal choice, like the doctor that Susie spoke about. Um, and it just really accounts for individual differences in people's genes, beyond genes, in their environment, in their lifestyles. And it just really gives, it's another tool to better understand complex um, mechanisms underlying um, health conditions and diseases just to better predict what treatments will be best to support people um, with specific genetic disorders or not. So they're doing a lot of work right now around cancer. Of course, a lot, um, a lot of the focus on autism and other developmental dis disabilities. And I just thought this was a good, good slide to kind of wrap up Kayla's story and to say that, you know, it's a true testament to um, just you know, it's parent, the power of parents. So I just want you to take that with you as you go throughout your careers and, and just, you know, a lot of my time when I was with the early intervention system, when people, when I was the, the user of, not the one going out and helping uh, to translate, was a lot of my time was really spent, um, you know, helping the parents navigate the system. That was half of it. And really just information is empowerment. So giving parents tools, on, on how to research different um, different things that would support them or their children just goes a long way. And that, that's something that I always took with me um, on both sides as, as a user of the early intervention system and also when I was going out to parents' houses to translate. So, um, you know, I know we're running out of time. So, um, we're, you know, you'll see a little bit of some of the resources at the NIH, about the NIH and what it does and, and where where we are in, in Kayla's story, but I just thought I would just be a good, you know, a couple slides towards the end um, to to kind of wrap it up since we only have about ten minutes left, and I know we want to leave time for questions. Um, 
you have a resource sheet that has resources both for providers um, where you can look up genetic information, resources about where you can find more information about um, service provision within the state, um, as well as resources for family. The ones that are listed here are also included in that sheet. This is that service map that I talked about. The yellow shaded areas are the ones where we have public health departments and clinic genetic centers. Those are state-funded agencies um, that provide genetic services. Um, you can see that there's a lot of unshaded areas, so some families will have to travel very far to actually access these um, services that are, um, that are available at a reduced cost. Um, and then here are the resources for families. Um, Genetic Alliance, Genetic Home Reference, and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. But they have great information both about genetics in general, about specific disorders, and also about um, support groups. So if you have a family going through this, I think giving them this information would be super helpful. And this is Kayla. If you want to watch her video on Kayla and kind of it wraps up her story, um, and this is a YouTube video that they did about two years ago. Um, so, you know, I'm going to say that it's worth your time to spend six minutes watching the video. And the picture on the bottom is actually um, the National Institutes of Health. It's, it's a huge campus located in Bethesda, Maryland, 300-acre um, campus. And I was actually there on Monday of this week. I went for um, the last day of February, it's always Rare Disease Awareness Day. And I was there on Monday, and where a lot of the focus was on genetic, genetic testing, gene therapy um, around rare diseases and other and other disabilities or other special health care needs um, across the spectrum. So that's where, since Kayla was one, and we still go to the NIH, and I still see her doctors there, and Kayla, you know, as well. We go there now. We're going at about maybe twice a year, but there was a time in Kayla's life when she was really young that we would go every six weeks for a week as part of the protocol. And so she is in a, what they call a natural, a, natu a natural history protocol. So Kayla will go to the NIH um, as, at her choosing. You know, she decides to. She can drop out any time, any protocol. But she, she's uh, registered to go through the uh, protocol for the rest of her life as part of a natural history study at the NIH. So I encourage you to get on the NIH.gov website to poke around around different different um, you know, things that may interest you and really use it as a resource for your family. And that's Kayla again. Just now, I just wanted to to say this is this is another more recent picture of her. Um, you know, it's her story. I always, 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 and I always say this when I present about her. I do always ask her if it's okay to talk about kind of her story. I'm telling you the story from my mom's view, my perspective. Kayla maybe, you know, and I've asked her, you know, do you remember what it was like to be in so much pain when you were little? And she says no. You know, she's kind of lived a pretty typical life because of the medicine that we get for her at the NIH. And we still give her the medicine every day. It's actually a shot that we give her daily that kind of keeps her symptoms at bay. And that was the, the trial that she's in is for this medicine. And she really, um, it's, it's her timing, you know. There's sometimes that she, she feels comfortable telling people about her syndrome. There's sometimes that she kind of is more reserved. You know, there's, there's, there was a time that we were at the NIH, and I remember clearly, you know, I looked at her phone just, you know, because, you know, she has a cell phone, just, and I looked at it, and she was like, we were at the NIH for her medical treatment, and this was about a year ago, and she said, oh, I'm here, you know, one of her friends like, where are you? Why aren't you at school? And she's like, oh, I came with my mom to do some stuff in D.C. or something along those lines. And it kind of broke my heart a little bit, like, what does she tell people? And, you know, obviously she's okay with me talking to other parents, to other professionals when I get asked to speak, but what is it from her perspective? And I asked her about it afterwards, and she just feels like she can tell only her really close circle of friends, but she, she just is not really ready to kind of, you know, explain it to anybody that asks her. So I think it really is a personal choice, just like genetic testing is, just like going through a lot of the, of, of the testing that we're talking about today. I think it is a personal choice, and it's a testament um, with Kayla to say that. So um, I think we have two slides um, just concluding. Um, 
things that EI providers can do, prepare families for a visit with a genetic specialist. Um, how we communicate with families really does frame their experience. So just be mindful of what we say and how we say it. Um, communicating the uncertainty, I think, is of paramount importance um, in order to manage parent expectations. Providing those written resources and support group referrals and then following up, I think, are all kind of um, things that uh, you and EI could do as providers. Well, thank you, ladies, both very much. I appreciate the time and the so much information. And there are so many questions out there. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we will send the questions to our presenters to um, give them an opportunity to respond. And we can send those out um, through an email to the participants today. Um, again, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are uh, finishing up here, we will be sending you out a, uh, an email that has the, um, the uh, link for the SurveyMonkey, and uh, you'll get your certificate of attendance in the next few hours. I will put up their email as well. Uh, so if you do have questions for them and you want to just ask them directly, this is their email address. So um, you can email them directly. But other than that, um, again, thank you, ladies, very much. Uh, Kayla sounds awesome and it's wonderful and what a great, unfortunately, um, it's a great experience and unfortunately how that happened to be, but um, awesome great experience. So with that, our webinar is ended and uh, we will see many of you next week for our next Wednesday's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. As folks are leaving too, remember next Wednesday Thank will you. be on Thank fetal alcohol syndrome, which Crudy brought up briefly. Thanks all.